Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. Andrew is away tonight. Tricky, treacherous, and a total success. Touch on confirmed. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars. NASA's most ambitious Mars mission ever. Perseverance lands with more than a little help from Canadian scientists. What the mission means for the hunt for life elsewhere. Also tonight, we investigate the unregulated industry of private COVID-19 tests. Who's doing the test? What are the standards? They can cost hundreds of dollars, and as we found out, there are questions about oversight. And engine fires and fast lane failures. I'm in the middle of the highway. Is this how my life ends? We investigate the dangers putting drivers at risk and expose flaws in Canada's recall system. This is The National. What a day for the people on this planet. So many feeling shackled by COVID claustrophobia. But just hours ago, the hopes of humanity shot through outer space and did some amazing things. Yes. Yes. The navigation yes. has confirmed that the parachute has deployed and we are seeing significant deceleration. So that was just the first breathtaking moment as the aptly named Perseverance rover reached Mars. The ninth time a U.S. craft has landed there, but the first time rover will fetch. Tashana Reed has the story that is extending humanity's reach. At an altitude of about 15 kilometers from the surface. With clenched jaws and anxious pauses. 300 meters off the surface of Mars. NASA scientists mesmerized as Perseverance hurtled towards Mars. 11 minutes after it happened, the signal reached Earth. Touch on confirmed. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars. An exuberant moment that masks couldn't muffle. And so this is one step along the way of our journey to accomplish that goal. And it's a major step. Perseverance landed safely in an ancient river delta known for its steep cliffs and rocky surface and quickly sent back the first images. Now the SUV-sized rover will collect samples of soil and sediments to answer the question, did life ever exist on Mars? That was intense. I, Chris Hurd is one of a number of Canadian researchers who will analyze samples collected from Mars. The key thing for us on the mission is to make sure we have the key set of of samples, most importantly, rocks that we think hold evidence for ancient life on the surface of Mars. Perseverance is NASA's largest and most advanced rover to land on the Red Planet. It features lasers, drills, HD video and microphones, even an autonomous helicopter. But unlocking the planet's secrets will take time. NASA will need to send another spacecraft to retrieve all that it collects. We've never tried to send something back from Mars before. And so we have to design a whole new architecture to be able to collect the samples. If all goes as planned, the collection from Mars will arrive on Earth in 2031. Scientists here say it's well worth the wait. It's not an understatement to say that those samples, once they get back to the Earth in 10 years, will revolutionize our understanding of Mars and, our, and the solar system generally. Now, NASA will focus on making sure Perseverance can complete its mission. Tashana Reed, CBC News, Toronto. It is a little hard to imagine the talent it takes to pull off a mission like that. Many hands, many sharp minds, some of them Canadian. We spoke with three of those scientists about what it took and how it feels. Hi, my name is Aaron Gibbons. Richard Leveille. My name is Tim Haltigan. I am the senior mission scientist in planetary exploration at the Canadian Space Agency. I'm excited to be part of the science team that will work with the Perseverance rover on Mars. I have the privilege of supporting the SuperCam instrument on board the rover, which uses lasers to identify the rocks and soils that most likely preserve fossils of ancient life. It's not just about the science that we're going to be doing in the next two years with this particular rover, but it's about what type of science are we going to be able to do 10, 20, 30 years from now. I'm excited about the prospect of possibly finding traces of ancient life on Mars and answering the age-old question, are we alone in the universe? Today's the story of dreams. I grew up on a farm in Saskatchewan, and every night I was able to go out and look up at the night sky and see this beautiful blanket of stars and always made me wonder what was out there and, and how we could study it. 
And for more on the Mars landing, we are joined now by CBC Science reporter Nicole Mortolaro. So, Nicole, what a huge day. But I, I'm so curious, why is this mission so different from the ones before? This is truly unprecedented. This is a massive scientific laboratory that is on the surface. Now, NASA started nice and slow in the beginning of exploration of Mars. It was rovers that were looking for past signs of water that might have existed. They found it. Then they were looking for past signs of habitability. They found it. And now Perseverance is there looking for signs of past life. So it will be looking for biosignatures hidden in the rocks in this delta that has never been explored before. Okay, so now the Perseverance has landed safely. We know that. What does it do next? Well, you know what? We're going to have to be a little patient uh, in the next few days. Well, first of all, tomorrow, hopefully, we'll see video of that descent, which was, you know, that seven minutes of terror. But then they're going to slowly unfurl the uh, scientific instruments, take a few steps forward and then a few steps backwards. And then there's going to be Ingenuity, the helicopter, which is going to be amazing. They're going to drive out to that site and do a test of uh, the helicopter. They do anticipate it could take about 40 days. And then in the spring, they're actually going to start their scientific mission. All right, Nicole, thank you so much. Let's turn now to a CBC News investigation into the growing and largely unregulated industry of private COVID testing in this country. We found a confusing sector where costs and in some cases, even test results just don't always match up. Aaron Saltzman takes us inside. Mary Aslin Sr.'s residence had been COVID free the entire pandemic. Then the day before Christmas. The RPN said, your mom has COVID. You guys have to leave. The 88 year old spent the holidays alone and scared. There were tears when we left. There was shaking. But it turned out the private company that processed Mary's test actually posted two conflicting results, one positive, one negative. With everything from airports to construction sites requiring frequent on-site testing to stay open, the private COVID testing industry is booming. Many companies are only months old. Who's doing the test? What are the standards? How do we know that they're doing it at the same uh, sensitivity and specificity as uh, that are done in, in provincial labs or hospital labs. Companies offering COVID PCR tests must use qualified personnel and equipment approved by Health Canada, but there's little oversight. We found a range of $160 to nearly $1,200 per test. There's no regulation on price, no arm's length system to deal with complaints or problems, no one tracking the total number of private tests in Canada or their positivity rates. A test positivity rate is important. That tells us that the penetration of the disease into the community. So um, I'm surprised that government isn't asking for this number. Private testing has allowed Canada's economy to reopen. From film sets to construction sites, employees need to be tested several times a week. It's not practical or likely even possible for the public system to handle the load. But the meteoric growth in the industry is also leaving people like Mary Aslin and her family wondering if it's getting enough scrutiny. So did she have it? Did she not have it? Was it extremely, extremely positive or was it extremely, extremely negative? So, Aaron, is Health Canada planning to step in there? Well, that's an interesting question, Adrian. You know, Health Canada and the Public Health Agency of Canada, or PHAC, uh, both say that this is provincial jurisdiction, and they're right. Health care, health testing is a provincial responsibility. But that also means that at this point, unless all of the provinces, or even if all of the provinces, start tracking COVID testing numbers that are done by private companies and testing or tracking their positivity rates, well, there won't be anybody keeping track of it on a national level. Adrian. All right, Aaron Salzman, we'll keep an eye on this. Thank you, Aaron. You bet. Canada is reporting a little more than 3,300 new cases today, more than yesterday, but continuing that downward trend overall. The consequences remain deadly serious, though. 67 new deaths were reported today. More than 21,000 Canadians have been killed by the virus since the pandemic began. Not counted among them yet, this young frontline worker in Saskatchewan. He died of a cardiac arrest not long after testing positive. And while officials work to confirm the cause of death, 
he is mourned and hailed as a hero. Bonnie Allen brings us his story. When I am with you. Tom Thomas and his wife arrived in Canada from India five years ago. Both registered nurses with big dreams now dashed. The 34-year-old died of cardiac arrest after testing positive for COVID-19. While not yet classified as a COVID death, it's being investigated. Increased prevalence of cardiac arrest has been linked to the virus. It's a difficult situation. Childhood friend Don Paul speaks for the family. He says Thomas was working as a care aide at this psychiatric hospital in North Battleford and as a frontline worker got the first dose of vaccine in early February. He was happy to get the vaccine uh, just so that way, you know, he can protect and take care of others, right? So he was quite happy. But just 24 hours later, Thomas was told he'd been exposed to the virus inside the hospital where there was a confirmed outbreak. He tested positive, isolated from his family, then went to the emergency room with chest pain. My condolences uh, to the family. Uh, this is a, a, a young fellow, uh, a, a hero on the front lines. The Premier spoke about Thomas's death while unveiling a mass immunization clinic in Regina, one of hundreds of locations prepared to dole out thousands of vaccines as fast as they arrive. But until then... We need to keep our guard up. If you pick up any disease in the first two weeks after the first shot, it might mean that you've been exposed before that first needle. After the first dose, research suggests there's no real protection for at least 12 days. You may only get 50 to 80 percent protection starting about two weeks afterwards in that initial phase. Your protection from severe disease or dying is almost 100 percent. Don Paul is a health care worker who's waiting on his second dose that's been delayed. But I haven't received it, so uh, just a little worried. For now, he's focusing on funeral arrangements for his friend. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. Now, Thomas's story highlights the urgency of the vaccination effort. Many Canadians are banking on a big ramp up between April and June, but how big depends on which shots have been approved by Health Canada. The federal government said today 14.5 million Canadians could be vaccinated by the end of June. That's with the currently approved Pfizer and Moderna shots alone, but that number could grow to 24.5 million if shots from three other vaccine makers are approved for use. Ottawa maintains that all those who want the shot will have it by September. This is an uneasy night for an isolated community on the Labrador coast. After months with no COVID-19, they're waiting to hear whether a highly contagious variant has reached their shores. It's, you know, not a time to point fingers or blame or anything as such. Nobody wants this terrible illness. One person is in the, in the community is isolating, presumed positive, after returning from St. John's, where there's an outbreak of the variant first found in the UK. A test was flown to St. John's, and the results could be known Friday. Most of the 400 people who live in that community are now getting tested. This as the island of Newfoundland recorded 48 new cases of COVID-19. The surging virus raises challenge after challenge, as Newfoundland and Labrador struggles to complete what is now a mail-in election. The deadline to apply for a ballot is tomorrow. Tonight, Chris O'Neill Yates talks with people who are worried the new method means they might lose the right to vote. In ordinary times, during in-person elections, people with disabilities can get help at the polling booth. But the province's unprecedented move to all mail-in ballots poses a challenge. That sort of like takes away my, uh, my privacy, my independence. Terry Gardner says voting is not easy. The mail-in ballot is a three-step process. You know, for somebody who's blind, basically it's, it's you know, non-democratic. Right. Nancy Reed's daughter is non-verbal and can't write. She can read and she reads well and she can mark an X in a circle. But her daughter can't fill out a ballot like this, where you have to write in the name of your chosen candidate Reed says she could help her, but... Our choice of who we vote for should be something that we own. She loves to vote. Uh, it's something that she takes great pride in. It's something that she has been able to do independently, and that's being denied. Other vulnerable populations are worried about being disenfranchised. It's hard to imagine a process that's less inclusive than this, you know? 
Dan Meads works with people who are homeless. He says many don't have any identification or a home address to register, much less a phone or a computer to request a mail-in ballot. Under normal circumstances, they could walk down to the polling station, sign an affidavit saying who they are and that they live in, a, in the riding or in the district, and be able to vote. The chief electoral officer says his aim is to leave no one out. If you let us know what particular issue you may have or disability that prevents you from being able to go through government, we'll, we'll figure out a way uh, to make sure that you get to vote. Basically, we're talking about, um, you know, voter suppression. I'm left feeling like my daughter uh, is less than a citizen. And if her daughter can't vote, Reed and her husband will register their protest by not voting either. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, St. John's. There's more bad COVID news from the airline industry tonight. WestJet says it is temporarily cutting service to some communities in four provinces. The Calgary-based airline says starting next month through to June, it will suspend four domestic routes in Alberta, Ontario and Atlanta, Canada. The company's CEO says he had no other option, blaming the cuts on dwindling demand due to travel restrictions. A CBC News investigation has spurred change in Ontario where legislation has been introduced to protect the rights of those with loved ones in retirement homes and long-term care. Two years ago, our colleagues at Marketplace exposed how easy it is for homes to deny access. David Common takes us through it. Well before COVID's lockdowns, this was as close as Mary Sardellis could get to her mom. You didn't get to see her on Christmas Not Day? Not on Christmas Day. Uh, what about uh, Thanksgiving? No. Banned by the owner of her mom's retirement home, he says for aggressive behavior, she says after speaking out about intolerable living conditions. He didn't like the sound of my voice. He says, I'm calling the police to remove you. A CBC Marketplace investigation two years ago found multiple similar instances across Canada. Homes handing out trespass orders. In Ontario, they don't even need to go to court. Just write a letter or verbally warn even family members to stay out. There appears to be a message to visitors. <laughs> it would seem so. And what is you're, that message? You're not welcome. Not Silence welcome. required. You're, you're not, you're, yeah, shut yeah. Up and shut up. The trespass order Many lawyers say the practice is illegal if used to silence critics. Oftentimes, the uh, person who receives the notice is frightened and intimidated. Hi. Mary Sardellis wasn't and went in. Police were called. She was charged. Though months later, prosecutors dropped the case. These are difficult times. Now, Ontario's opposition is proposing legislation to expressly forbid care and retirement homes from using trespass orders. They shouldn't be able to use trespass orders in a way that is uh, retaliatory towards family members who are raising concerns about the conditions of their loved ones. It's using and abusing Sardellis joined the NDP announcement. And they've been using it as a retaliation against advocates. She has since moved her mom to another home. The government has not said whether it will support the NDP's proposal, noting there is a complaints process for use at retirement homes. During COVID, Sardellis worries those homes could continue to use these orders to silence critical voices. David Common, CBC News, Toronto. Today, the federal government introduced a bill to repeal some mandatory minimum penalties that disproportionately impact Indigenous and Black Canadians. But as Olivia Stefanovic tells us, critics worry it won't be enough to address inequity in the system. It's a lot harder to get a second chance the way things are now, particularly if you happen to be a young person who is black or who is indigenous. An admission from the justice minister. The criminal justice system isn't working for everyone. Inuit, Métis and First Nations make up 5% of the general population, but account for more than 30% of federally incarcerated inmates. Black inmates represent 7.2% of the federal offender population, but only 3% of the population. This is shameful. As a way to put a dent in those numbers, the federal government introduced Bill C-22 today. It would repeal mandatory minimum penalties for all drug and some firearm offenses, 
allow judges to let low-risk offenders to serve sentences in their own homes, and encourage police and prosecutors to divert people in simple possession of hard drugs to addiction treatment centers. It's uh, a belated um, legislative uh, intervention. Legal experts say taking drug possession out of the courts is a good idea, but there's worry about who gets to make the call. We're putting more discretion into the hands of folks who have traditionally had discretion and exercise their discretion in a way that led to the problem that we are now trying to solve. Some want the government to go even further and eliminate simple possession charges altogether. This is not groundbreaking. Um, what would be groundbreaking is if they said, don't charge people who are doing nothing other than just having a drug on them. Attempts to address the over-incarceration of Black and Indigenous inmates have been made before, but no government to date has been able to reverse the trend. Olivia Stepanovich, CBC News, Ottawa. Texas is still reeling days after a brutal winter storm. Guys, um, so this is my house. <laughs> Next on The National, while Texas freezes without power or safe drinking water, where is their senator? A surge in violent shoplifting caught on camera. Why the pandemic may be fueling a rise in crime. And Marketplace investigates vehicle recalls from engine fires to failures. I'm in the middle of the highway. Is this how my life ends? Are more drivers at risk? We're back in two. Welcome back. Texas remains under a state of emergency tonight following a powerful winter storm that killed at least 16 people there. Katie Simpson shows us the desperate situation on the ground and what happened when a high profile senator took off in the middle of a crisis. Our whole apartment! Look at the. Y'all, I cannot believe this. Come Add flooding the to the list of brutal challenges Texans are facing. Guys, um, so this is my house. <laughs> Water pipes are bursting in the frigid conditions, leaving behind a path of destruction. Inside my apartment, the windows started to literally freeze in ice. I could feel the snow come in through my closed door. Crystal Hartman is staying at her boyfriend's house as she's one of the hundreds of thousands still without power. I mean, it's it's frustrating to say the very least and also scary and just to where you get to where it's depressing. Outages have now hit water treatment plants, triggering dozens of boil water advisories. And with some grocery stores running out of essentials, people are lining up for help. I don't think any of us was expecting this and for it to be like this. So it's all about survival right now until it starts getting warm. As Texans struggle, Republican Senator Ted Cruz was photographed heading to Mexico for a vacation, even though days before he pleaded with Texans to hunker down. So don't risk it. Keep, keep your, your family safe and ju just stay home and hug your kids. After the posts went viral on social media, Cruz returned home, claiming he was just dropping off his 10 and 12 year old kids. Yesterday, my daughters asked if they could take a trip with some friends and Heidi and I agreed. So I flew down with them last night, uh, dropped them off here and now I'm headed back to Texas. Amid backlash and ridicule, Cruz retreated. Look, it, it was obviously a mistake and in hindsight, I, I wouldn't have done it. Um, I was trying to be a dad. Warmer weather arrives in Texas this weekend, though several spots along the U.S. East Coast are bracing for another blast of winter. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. A shock for Facebook users in Australia. The social media giant blacked out news on its app in a fight over efforts to have tech giants pay for content. And as Thomas Degler tells us, lawmakers in this country are watching. Call it an unpleasant surprise, Australian Facebook users logged on to find all news articles had disappeared. I can get all of my news in the one spot, so it will really impact me. People will just revolt against it. Like, honestly, like, especially the younger generation. At issue, the Australian government's plan to make big U.S. tech firms pay media outlets for content. News organizations have long complained their journalism gets shared without compensation. But with its proposed solution, 
this relatively small country has become a target of the world's biggest social media company. Facebook actions were unnecessary. They were heavy handed and they will damage its reputation here in Australia. Not only did Facebook ban Australian users from sharing legitimate news, pages belonging to the country's media outlets now appear blank, even from Canada. The law as it stands fundamentally misunderstands the way that news works on Facebook. But as it removed news, Facebook also struck unintended targets. An indigenous organization, a women's shelter, even regional health authorities sharing COVID information. All their pages were wiped. Will the minister insist that Facebook pay what they owe? In the NDP raised the issue in the House of Commons with the Liberal government planning to table similar legislation soon. Our government is at the forefront of, of the battle to ensure that the web giants pay their fair share. Australia's proposed law led Google this week to strike deals with some publishers, but no one's found a perfect plan yet. This law basically indirectly gets people into the, uh, the government into the business of deciding who's a news media organization. Australia is the first country confronting big tech in this way, and the world is watching. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. Ahead tonight, some Canadians tell us they are afraid to drive their own cars. I put it on the gas pedal, but I'm getting nothing. From engine failures to fires, Marketplace investigates whether the recall system is broken too. First though, Rosie's here with that issue. Hey Adrian, tonight we're gonna to talk about the growing pressure for Canada to call out China. If that's not a genocide, what more evidence does this prime minister need? Plus, what you need to know about the amended medical assistance in dying bill. Chantal, Althea, and Shachi Curl will join all of us after this. The Conservative Party is urging the federal government to stand up to China, calling for specific words and actions. Today, Canada's Conservatives are calling on the Parliament of Canada to recognize that genocide is currently being carried out by the People's Republic of China against Uyghur, Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims. Calls echoed by the other opposition parties, but declarations the government is not yet ready to make. We recognize that we have many partners who have already identified this as a genocide. We will continue to work with them and others as we move forward in the right way for Canadians and indeed for people around the world. So what is the opposition strategy here? How does freeing Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor, the two Canadians detained in China, play into how the government's own messaging uh, is on this issue? It's Thursday. I'm here with that issue. Chantal Hébert, Athia Raj, and Shachi Curl joins us on this Thursday because Andrew is off. Good to see everybody. Um, let, let's start with you, Chantal, on the conservative strategy. Why do you think they have chosen this issue at this moment? I mean, they, they've always been uh, happy to talk about China and being tough on China, but why right now? Because it's got legs in public opinion, because uh, the Uyghur uh, reporting is quite damning uh, on the human rights front, uh, because uh, most Canadians who are watching this from outside are thinking, how in the world are we going to be sending athletes uh, uh, to play in China, given everything that has happened and everything that is happening there? And, and Althea, the, the fact that we have two Canadians being detained there, how much does that sort of prevent the government from being harder, from talking tougher? Well, I suspect the way that you're asking the question, uh, you know as well as we all do, <laughs> that it is playing heavily yeah. um, in the government's uh, approach to China. And frankly, that's one of the reasons why Justin Trudeau and the government has looked uh, weak, has been vulnerable to conservative attacks. Uh, looks like they're indecisive. They're unsure what to do. The fact that we still we don't yet have an answer on whether Huawei is going to be allowed to be part of the 5G network in this country. I mean, everything is being seen, it seems, through the prism of the two Michaels. And uh, that's why a lot of things on the China front are not going to get done. But I mean, to Shantad's point, the opposition motion 
is very smart on behalf of the Conservatives. Public opinion is squarely behind them. You don't even need to think just about COVID. Look at what has happened in Hong Kong. Um, the trust factor uh, that Keynes, like China is the like the number one public enemy in public opinion polls when you look at where Canadians are. Um, and it splits liberals. I mean, liberal MPs on the subcommittee uh, yeah. voted to declare this a genocide. And so um, it's going to be very interesting to see which way uh, the liberal cabinet um, and some liberal backbenchers vote on Monday. Yeah, because the vote uh, on the opposition day motion doesn't happen until Monday. It's 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 interesting for all those reasons, uh, Shachi. But it's also um, it, it's also interesting that they want to talk about it now, as opposed to COVID and other things. And you have to wonder if it's because, as Chantel suggests, it's getting more traction. This is it, as an issue. Well, look, first of all, people are experiencing incredible amount of pandemic fatigue. So how many how many weeks have panels like us and Canadians just completely maxed out on when is this going to end? When do we start to see vaccines coming online? But more than that, this is something that resonates with Canadians in a very visceral way. You know, uh, Chantal and Althea talked about public opinion polling. Let me put some data behind that. 88 mm -hmm. Of Canadians saying that they don't trust Beijing on law and order or on human rights. 14%, 14% of Canadians say they have a favorable view of China. But but what's the what's what's the id on this? What's the big Benini on this in terms of, of uh, Aaron O'Toole and his play? Mm -hmm. He's also doing this in part because it's an issue that allows him to grow his base and actually pick up some resonance with people who would not necessarily consider the Conservative Party on issues of the environment or on issues of social conscience or indeed on issues of vaccination. So Here's a, a really clear policy issue that Canadians are aligned on. And he gets to come out and say, I'm being thoughtful about this. And I have an ability to actually reach across to people who maybe wouldn't consider the Conservatives for a lot of reasons, but might on China at a time when the Trudeau Liberals are fighting two things. They're fighting the fact that there's not a lot they can do on this file, as long as the two Michaels are not home. And the fact that they now carry the stink of some 30 plus years of looking quite soft or warm or friendly with China, which will come back to haunt them long term. Uh, Chantal, one more po point on how, how the governments responded to this. Uh, I'm guessing that the government's uh, best plan would have been to wait to see if the Biden administration's arrival would have changed the paradigm on uh, the two Michaels. Uh, and given them a bit more room to maneuver. But it's becoming an issue of principle for many Canadians. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and the Olympic Games, it's not some arcane public policy discussion here. People can do the math. One plus one equals what in the world are we doing? For Justin Trudeau, who found the word genocide not that loaded when it came to uh, Indigenous Canadians, and perhaps he was right. But at this point, having seen what's happening in China, the question people are bound to ask is, if that's good enough for us, how can it not be what is happening there? OK, mm -hmm. let, let, let's move on to the amended medical assistance and dying legislation passed uh, in the Senate last night. Uh, it is now there's a, there's another deadline now coming up uh, next week for the government to to respond. And the Senate moved to actually expand the criteria. And some of the criticism uh, from that, Althea, inside the Senate was that the government was maybe too quick to respond to one lower court ruling instead of going to the Supreme Court or asking for another reference or some legal opinion around what was the best way to respond. What, what is this going to actually look like when it's done? Uh, it's probably going to look like the bill that went to the Senate mm -hmm. and not the bill that has come out of the Senate. Uh, the senators and Don Platt, the leader of the Conservative Senate, had a good speech yesterday, I think, outlining a lot of the um, concerns that some who are not in the majority at all about a this bill overwhelmingly uh, passed the Senate with modified amendments that, as you say, enlarge the scope of the bill. But they, the Conservatives mostly, are concerned that, some, and I should say some Conservatives, are concerned that the bill does not um, give enough protection to uh, people with disabilities who might feel pressured to uh, have to take medically assisted dying. The Conservatives made the point that back in 2016, 
Uh, the government promised more investments in palliative care that would uh, help solve some concerns on this front, and that that really hasn't happened. Um, but the overwhelming majority of senators really believe that the bill actually should be more expansive mm. than even what the Quebec Superior Court said. Shachi, it does seem as though, um, it, I mean, if you look at the amendments, it seems as though that maybe public opinion is has moved very quickly uh, around medically assisted dying. But maybe maybe that's that's not what you've seen. You know, the top line results around a lot of polls, the main takeaway is often that a majority of Canadians support this and they support opening it up even more. But within that, you know, there are pockets that are just not there yet. When we think about the divide between Quebec and the rest of Canada on this issue, Quebecers are consistently more likely to be supportive of uh, opening it up, making it easier than people in other parts of the country. Uh, within visible minority or immigrant communities, there's still a lot of pushback and a lot of concern. And not to, to say nothing of the concerns that exist within uh, communities of people with disabilities, yeah. uh, Althea touched on palliative care. There's also the long-term care issue. And so we're really also having a bit of a reckoning around how do we want to treat people at the end of their lives if they want to die at home and the investments aren't there, if they are disabled and there's a, a subtle pressure around, well, it's going to cost a lot of money to treat you. These are the things that I think people are not quite ready to go yeah. down that road around. And that's why you see that reticence from government. And, and how much does politics fit into all of this, Chantal? Uh, you know, that divide between Quebec and the rest of Canada, for instance. It only fits in up to a point. Uh, to tell you the truth, if we'd waited for every pocket of resistance uh, to abortion okay. rights and same-sex marriage to disappear, it wouldn't have happened. Um, I look at those votes in the House of Commons on the legislation to make it less restrictive and the vote in the Senate to make it even less restrictive than the House of Commons plan. To 212 to 107, I would say, in the House of Commons, four parties versus one. That's a pretty clear statement. Mm -hmm. In the Senate, 66 versus 19. So, yes, there are objections uh, and there are grounds for debate. But on one thing, the two houses have agreed, and it is that the current status quo should be made less restrictive. Okay, we'll leave it there. Good conversation on both topics. Thank you very much. Before we go, though, be sure to subscribe to Add Issue, the podcast for extra content. This week, we're going to talk about this one. Mr. Lametti and I have the honour to present to the House Bill C-21, a bill that, when passed, will significantly strengthen gun control in Canada. You can find that on any major podcast app and on our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national. Okay, Rosie, so what's the plan? What are you working on for this Sunday's edition of Rosemary Barton Live? A couple things, Adrian. Uh, vaccines obviously ramping up, so our province is ready to actually make sure that people can get those jabs. And starting this coming Monday is when people arriving by air will have to go into those quarantino hotels. So we'll tell you the latest uh, on what you need to know and talk to some people who are a little frustrated with all of it still. All right, we'll be watching. Thanks, Rosie. Thanks, Adrian. And next, Marketplace investigates car recalls for fires and failures. This thing is coming fast to a halt, and I'm in the middle of the highway. Is this how my life ends? Why the fix has left some drivers still feeling unsafe. And a spike in violent crime caught on camera. What might be a disturbing new reality for retail workers? Welcome back. Thousands of engine fires and failures across North America have left Canadian drivers angry, confused, and even terrified to drive their own cars. Now a joint investigation by our colleagues at CBC Marketplace and Go Public has found drivers could still be at risk. Rosa Marcatelli now with the flaws in Canada's recall system. An engine fire suddenly breaks out at the side of an Ontario highway. I don't want to get too close because it is exploding. Another one starts just minutes after the car is parked, caught on camera. That's Abby Sankar's Hyundai Elantra burning. There it is, my car, it's still here. We went along with him to see what's left of the car in a junkyard, a far cry from when he bought it new seven years ago. It's just unbelievable. 
to see this car in this situation. Then there are the engines that suddenly die at high speeds, a lot of them. I noticed that my foot is on the gas pedal, but I'm getting nothing. The engine in Keisha Taylor's Hyundai Santa Fe failed on a highway. This thing is coming fast to a halt, and I'm in the middle of the highway. Is this how my life ends? Many of the potentially dangerous engines recalled have no fix besides an entire engine replacement. Instead, the car makers have installed sensors that are supposed to warn drivers of a pending engine failure or fire so they can get to a dealership. But some drivers, like Keisha, tell us that their sensors didn't warn them of anything when their engines died. That is a very serious safety issue, absolutely. George Eney is a consumer advocate with the Automobile Protection Association. That would suggest then that we need to have, a, I would say, a wary eye over this recall. The implications if the knock sensor system doesn't work are pretty staggering. The car makers tell us their early warning sensors are independently tested and state of the art, and that engines die for many reasons, not just a manufacturing defect. Little reassurance for Keisha, Abby, and other Hyundai and Kia owners who worry profits are coming before safety. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Calgary. For the full investigation, watch Marketplace tomorrow night on CBC Television and CBC Gem. Next, a terrifying new reality for some retail workers. Our store manager has been chased around the store with a syringe. We've had knives pulled, some hammers, batons, bear spray. Why the pandemic may be causing a rise in violent shoplifting. There is a disturbing trend on the rise in Vancouver. Over the course of the pandemic, violent thefts have increased by, get this, 260%. Tanya Fletcher on the why and the businesses that are fed up. Watch as the suspected shoplifter makes his escape. One final blast of bear spray as he leaves. The individual came right out this door and around the corner. It happened at this London Drugs in the heart of downtown Vancouver. And in this case, it was stolen vitamins. The disturbing part of it is since the pandemic began, we've seen a real expansion in the violence in shoplifting. He says COVID has acted as a crime funnel, concentrating the problem in stores that are still open. In fact, there have been 250 violent thefts in the city in the past month alone, and a combined $50,000 in merchandise stolen. Over the course of their four-week investigation, Vancouver police arrested 130 offenders and recommended 268 criminal charges. They terrorized employees, sometimes young female clerks who were in the stores by themselves. Uh, they used weapons, they threatened, uh, they intimidated anybody who stood in their way. He had a knife in his hand and threatened me. At this downtown IGA, violent thefts are up 50% since the start of the pandemic. It's become so common, staff are now dealing with at least one confrontation per day. Our store manager has been chased around the store with a syringe. We've had knives pulled, hammers, batons, uh, all a variety of weapons, bear spray many times. Um, and that never used to happen. We never used to see that. These people, based on some of the descriptives, are chronic offenders. At BC's former Solicitor General says the pandemic and the opioid crisis have combined to make an existing problem worse. Many of these people are drug addicted. Many of these people have mental health issues. Now, when you take the convergence of those issues with the pandemic and the need for them to support themselves, it's not surprising we have this particular spike. A spike in violent thefts that may be too complex for a quick fix. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver. And next on The National, a bored amateur photographer, a telescope and a camera. The story behind these spectacular snapshots next in our moment. This stunning view is a snapshot of space. The photo was taken by Adrian Aberdeen, accountant by day, astrophotographer by night. So Adrian hasn't left his house to take photos. Instead, he has turned his apartment balcony into his studio in light polluted Toronto. Tonight, his incredible captures are our moment. I was always uh, intrigued in, in the stars and in space and planets. Basically, I uh, bought a telescope. And before I know it, I was pulled into the world of astrophotography. 
my imaging for the last year now has always, it's all been from the balcony, but it's actually helped me to push my, uh, my photography even further. My favorite targets in the sky is actually M, what's called M42, which is the Orion Nebula. And there's just so much character in there. Uh, and there's some just deep, really super bright stars in that area of the sky. For one, it's therapy for me. And two, it's to pretty much just say there are better, bigger things in life that, uh, that we can focus on and enjoy. Okay, so that Adrian, not this Adrian, that Adrian says that one Boxing Day, uh, he bought this telescope because he was looking for a hobby, he didn't have one. He has no formal training in photography. That Adrian is incredible. This one is feeling bad about herself for not having a pandemic hobby. That is a national for February the 18th. Good night.